Hey everyone, welcome to the Hour of History podcast. It's so great to have you with us. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman, and this week I'm talking to John Farnden, London-based nonfiction author, playwright, poet, composer, and translator of literary works. It is a pleasure to have him on the Hour of History podcast because he has just worked on translating Roland Sazenbayev's The Dead Wander the Desert a novel out of Kazakhstan that takes you back to these environmental disasters back in the Soviet era, the Aral Sea drying up. It's a great introduction to Kazakh culture and to some of the finest poetry in Central Asia. It's out from Amazon Crossing just a couple weeks ago, and it is hours of entertainment that you're going to enjoy. Uh, in our conversation, John gives us some insight into how poetry sort of shapes these Central Asian cultures, how the environmental disasters might be more of a spiritual than a logistical problem, and how transitions in identity from Soviet to post-Soviet states are something that we should be talking about. There's a lot of great suggestions in this episode. As always, you can get links to them and more information at hourofhistory.com. Thanks so much for listening. On Hour of History, it's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our world, anytime, any place. For show notes, links, and more, be sure to visit our website at www.hourofhistory.com. And for all the book recommendations made during the podcast, head over to hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. Without further delay, your Hour of History starts right now. So here I am with uh, John Farndon. He's the translator of this fantastic new book, The Dead Wander in the Desert. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, actually. Yes, it's wet and cold in autumn London, but fine. <laughs> that sounds wonderful from hot, humid, and sticky Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, well, it's a pleasure to have you here with us on Hour of History. Uh, I think translation is a fantastic sort of aspect of, of international globalism and, and history, and I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your background first? Well, the interesting thing about um, my role in translation is that I don't actually speak any of the languages I translate. Um, what's interesting is that I kind of got into the whole business of translation when I wrote a play about Pushkin, um, and I discovered that the Pushkin translations were really bad. So I, uh, and I was talking to a Russian friend of mine and she said, well, I, uh, who spoke good English and her mother was a Pushkin seller. said, well, why don't we collaborate on this? And so we did that and that process of collaboration worked very well. She provided me with, um, a literal translation. Um, and her mother provided me with notes. And now that's the way I work with all translations, is basically I don't need to learn the native language. I work with a literal translation. And what that's done is uh, it's opened up me to translate a whole variety of languages which have not really been translated much before, like Kazakh and Uzbek and Tajik, um, because um, I can work with those translators and there aren't many translators who speak those languages. But by working in collaboration, that's what's opened opened up a whole wealth of literature that's quite new to the world, uh, to the English-speaking world. Yeah, and I think this is kind of a fantastic aspect because uh, traditionally, certainly in history, there's this roadblock um, of languages where, you know, historians are sort of expected to learn the language first and then you can go into the archive and it's only you and you interpret, blah, blah, blah. Um, But collaboration is a central part of this. Um, So it started with Pushkin then. Was there a draw to uh, Eastern Europe or to Central Asia? Well, it's interesting actually because... um, the, 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 the Russian, the play about Pushkin that I was, I was talking about um, was shortlisted for a, a, a major prize in this country, a translation prize, but because it actually wasn't a translation, it didn't win the prize, but it was a fascinating ceremony. I met this, uh, this man called Ravil Bukhariev, who was a, a Tatar author. Um, he wrote in Russian, but there was a certain sympathy um, there, and, he, and I translated his book. It was a wonderful book. Um, mem- he was a Muslim, um, and his book was Letters to Another Room, and it was about his relationship with his Christian Orthodox 
Christian Russian wife, who was a poet. Um, and what that did is that opened me up to a whole variety of Muslim authors. And Mus the, the, the Soviet di the, um, diaspora has left a whole variety of, of cultures uh, uh, un unaccounted for. And particularly, it's, it's, it's Muslim authors have been left out of the picture and Muslim authors in Central Asia. They, it's a fantastic ancient literature that comes from Turkic and Persian. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's something that really hasn't been translated into, into English very much before at all, if at any at all. And um, maybe before we dive into talking about uh, your most recent work, which was just released, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about some of those other uh, translations you've done, because you, you've been award-winning in your work, um, especially with these Central Asian post-Soviet states. Well, absolutely. I mean, one, one book I had a huge pleasure to work on was a book called The Devil's Dance by an author called uh, Hamid Ismailov, and he is... He is an extraordinary author. I think um, we, he will be recognized in time as one of the 21st century's great authors. Um, now, he just did this book uh, earlier this year, which was trans the prose was translated by um, a man called Donald Rayfield, but they had, he had real difficulty translating the poetry. Um, and they asked me to, to join that and to, to, to work on the poetry. And because of my work, way of working, which was collaborative, I found it very straightforward to, uh, that's a sort of slight exaggeration, but you know what I mean, mm -hmm. um, to translate um, oh, ancient gazals from, Tur from Turkic languages from Uzbek. And that's what, and various other things. And so there was a lot of poetry in this book. And this is one of the things that I was able to kind of bring a huge wealth of extraordinary new poetry via this book. And this is one of the things that helped it win the European Bank um, Literature Prize earlier this year. And so that was a, that it was a, an accolade for that collaborative way of working, basically. Hmm. And, um, and yeah, go on. No, I was going to say, and, and, and since then, I have been inundated with a whole variety of great Uzbek, Tajik and Kazakh poets who want their work translated because the good, the big strength of that is that I can translate poetry like doing that and poetry is very um, dear to the heart of those cultures <laughs> and, and so what what is it that sort of opens the access to translating poetry how, do, how does how does one do it successful because it seems like something that people might take for granted reading translated literature well I think it's, I think it's, again, it's this collaborative process because what my concentration is on creating the verse in English. So my skill is not, I don't have to learn to devote uh, a great deal of time to learning the foreign language. What I do is I devote my time to um, developing the poet, poetic skills. And so there are two elements to that. There's one is simply versifying skill, but it's also, um, a question of developing a way to get to the heart of the poetic meaning. And that's something that I've, I realized I've gradually learned over the, over the years of working like this. But um, it's an, a key part of my skill is understanding what the poet is trying to say and how that poem works. Um, and piecing the bits together from literal translations and every, everything else. So I think that's what's, what's key to it. It's the because I'm concentrating on only one aspect um, and somebody else does the literal translation and provides me with all the material, um, it's a different person in each case. But that collaboration works extraordinarily well, I'm, I'm beginning to find. Hmm. And it, um, in this latest work, uh, The Dead Wander in the Desert, you're working on Kazakhstan and it's another uh, collaborative um, effort can you maybe describe a little bit about the process um because this is this is a it's a magnificent book it's massive too <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely massive i mean what what's interesting is that it's we've um cut it down quite a bit from the original actually, oh. because the original was about almost twice as long um but roland is a roland sasibayev he's a he's a trend he wrote this book in the 
um, in the mid 1980s. And interestingly, he came, he came to me. To, he's he's never been translated, but he's been looking for the right translator. And he, via a, a, a contact, asked to meet me in the centre of London um, and came to me and said, would you like to, to translate my book? And I said, well, yes, I'm being <laughs> very interested. And he said, and I said, and he told me that his shaman had led me to, uh, led, led, led him to me. So <laughs> I thought, well, that puts a compulsion on me to translate this book. Um, <laughs> and, it, and I'd never asked in detail exactly why, uh, why or how his shaman did this, but um, I thought it was not my place to ask. But <laughs> I've, I've basically, what was, a, what was a fascinating thing is that um, Roland, in order to steep me in the world of the book, um, and his culture, invited me to come for a three-week lightning tour around Kazakhstan. And it was an extraordinary, extraordinary bit. Of it's a, I hadn't been to Kazakhstan, and it's a, a Kazakhstan before, and it's an incredible country. It's vast, for one thing. I mean, obviously, for the USA, it isn't vast, but someone from the UK, it's, it is a vast country because it's basically, it's, the, it's as big as the whole of Western Europe. Hmm. Um, and it, a lot of it is empty, but there are such riches in that country. And, and Roland took me around the, at every every key site that appear, appears in the novel. And um, we had some fantastic adventures and quite extraordinary adventures because we went to the the birthplace of Abai, who is Kazakhstan's great poet. Um, he's the Shakespeare of, or Pushkin of Kazakhstan. And it's right in the middle of the steps, miles from anywhere. Um, and actually very close to where Chinggis Khan raised his army, um, and it still hasn't changed in all those times. But the what, as I arrived there, they sacrificed a sheep for me. Um, hmm. So it's that kind of that kind of event, basically. Hmm. And so the uh, sacrifice and this description of your travel in uh, Kazakhstan it was in the middle of the middle of the steppe. Um, and I arrived at the, the monument site um, and I was very surprised to discover that they were going to sacrifice a sheep for them. It's something that's never been done before. <laughs> and what was extraordinary is the matter of fact way it was done as it's a very normal event there. Um, and so there were, I had to have many different cultural experiences um, while I was there. And one of the things that you sort of uh, mention as you're beginning the uh, the introduction to the book is is you yeah. talk about this tradition of sort of spoken word and song and poetry that goes on long into the night. So in the introduction to this book, you, you describe uh, your travels through Kazakhstan and you mention <laughs> the strength of sort of the oral tradition where people get together and uh, tell stories and, and exchange poems and songs that go sometimes hours and hours. Can you describe that a little bit? Absolutely. Well, the kind of thing is, of course, um, the Kazakhs are nomads. And so they have been sitting around and wandering around the steps for a long time and they actually have very little to do but apart from tell stories on the long dark nights and that but the skill that's been developed there in storytelling is extraordinary um so there are there are various aspects to this and one is the dash tarkan which is the ordinary everyday male and basically um speeching making speeches is a very, is a very key part of that and so you'll sit down at a meal and the meal will go on for many hours um, and the men take it in turns to, and it is principally men, to get up and make a, make a speech um, extempore. Um, and usually it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anecdote, but quite often it's just a, a speech praising the hosts and so on. But one of, one of the things is Roland, the author, he is, a, he is probably Kazakh's master of these speeches and he can go on literally for a, an hour or two off the cuff without stopping, without interruption, except for his mobile phone, as we just had. <laughs> um, and the, 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 he, will, he will put his phone down, put, pick the phone to his ears, everybody goes silent, and he carries on afterwards. Um, and that's the way it works. And then, of course, there's the other tr tr oral tradition, which is um, the poets. Um, 
and basically the poets are the people who've always carried the literature of the, of the, of the nations. And um, it's mostly oral poetry, and, then, and until a century ago, none of it was written down. Um, but what's, what it means is that they have this very competitive streak. Um, and, and basically, one of the events, of regular events, is these, these contests between poets. And it's something that's a really big thing in Kazakhstan is um, battles between poets. And it's so, it's so big still that this is, on, this is on national TV and the winning poet wins very significant prizes. So they're like rap battles, but it's between... But it's in the very ancient verse form. So hmm. this kind of oral tradition is very key to um, the whole culture of Kazakhstan. And it's something that I kind of wanted to try and capture in the book. Yeah. And that's one of the things that makes the, uh, the, the length of the book is not, you know, I've always found this reading uh, works from specifically Asia and India and Pakistan and now Central Asia is there's this sort of flow to these books that end up being massive by Western standards, but, but it, you get just totally immersed in it. Um, one, one of the things I was going to ask you, and you kind of just went into it right there with the example of the rap battle is as someone who's trying to sort of view it, view this through the Western mind, um, are, are there a lot of parallels that you see when you're over there? Um, well, one of the interesting things is, uh, um, it's not quite a parallel, but it's an interesting influence of the, is that what, as you probably gather, it's a very male culture. It's kind of the, around those dinner tables, then um, women are, are expected to be quiet and say say very little. But one of the kind of advantages of being a foreigner, um, not speaking the language, was that I talked to the, trans, the, the, the interpreters, and almost invariably the interpreters are women, because interpreting is seen as a as a women's task, basically, and kind of. Uh, men, men are a bit above that, but the the great thing about that is that actually languages have allowed w women to interact with the West in a way that men don't, um, hmm. and so as a result, women are beginning to take over in a very quiet way in Kazakhstan um, because of their kind of ability to deal with, with uh, deal with. English people, English speaking people and people elsewhere. I mean, one of the fascinating things is that I kind of went to, with Roland, we, I went to a school in Semi, which is where they used to do the nuclear testing. Um, and mm. it's one of these um, Nazarbayev schools, which are the kind of the, the top class schools where the brightest children goes. And I was able to talk to a class of um, up, up to 200 12 to 14 year olds and they are mostly girls, but I was able to speak to them in English because they understood it perfectly and I didn't have to kind of pause or talk slowly. And it was quite interesting because at the end of this uh, session, I said, well, actually, it's quite, it's nice to talk to you girls because I see you're the future of Kazakhstan. I didn't really mean anything particular about it. And I said, well, it's a mass, uh, I, I've noticed it's a very macho society and it's rather good that you girls are going to learning, learning your way forward. Hmm. And at that, they, the whole bunch of girls got up and cheered and did a high five. <laughs> um, so they know what they're, <laughs> they're doing. And that's what's fascinating. And I think that um, there's, that, that's what I'm saying about there's a, in some ways, there's, a, there's an interplay between cultures which works both ways. And I think actually the Central Asian cultures are also spreading out in different ways into the western world interesting um and the cultural interactions obviously central asia is kind of at the middle of these silk roads that have had cultural interactions for thousands and thousands of years um but one that the book focuses on is the interaction between russians and the soviet context um it, it, did you see many sort of uh echoes of the Soviet period, or is it like these uh, young women that you just described turning West and learning English and, and sort of erasing the Soviet past? Well, the interesting thing about that, that particular aspect is that um, what the Soviet Union did for them is it's left them with a, a, a very 
fecal education system, which they might never have had otherwise. And that, so um, because of that, um, it's a, as I said, it's a it's a tribal macho culture, and the so the Sovietization has been one of the kind of booms for especially for women, and has helped help break that down by providing very good education across the country. Of course, it, it's still a much divided country, but that's one of the kind of positive insects of so the Soviet Union. And it's, a, and it's an interesting thing because um, Kazakh authors, and including Roland himself, have a very ambiguous relationship with Russians and the Soviet Union because, as you can see in the book, it's hugely um, <coughs> critical of the Soviet period and what the Soviet Union did to Kazakhstan. But on the other hand, he is a Russian speaker. And he wrote that hmm. book in Russian, not in Kazakh. Um, and he frequently travels to Moscow, um, where actually he is accepted as an equal. So the connections haven't died. Um, and I think that one of the things is that that it's ta it it's taking quite a long time for Central Asian countries to assert their own identity. So, it, and it, despite the fact that um, the Soviet Union had a, a desperate, I mean, really desperate effect on some of these countries. Then there are still things that they, that benefited uh, for those countries. And you'll see in the book, for instance, then one of the things is that um, Roland harks back to very frequently is the news bulletins. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, in some ways, those are kind of comparisons with they're almost like the the, the the Quranic declamations, and that's a there is something is what the book is about is it's questioning where where truth comes from, and that's what the point of these things because of course in the Soviet Union they had these regular um, news bulletins on loudspeakers in a lot of villages so that people were kept informed. Of so there was that kind of sense of connection that came up in the Soviet Union, um, which hmm. is quite an interesting thing that, that I think that uh, the Kazakhstan is finding it not so easy to break away from as they thought it might be when they get claimed into independence um, 20 odd years ago. Hmm. It did. It does sort of um, contextualize the book fantastically. These news bulletins are interspersed throughout the text and um, they definitely had me as a historian going down some deep rabbit holes, you know, just thinking yeah. about yeah. what was happening elsewhere in the world. And you just mentioned, so for example, one of the news bulletins might say a, a nuclear test was successfully carried out. Um, and it's interesting to think in the context of people being on the opposite side of this massive country in Kazakhstan, hearing about nuclear tests on the other side, um, while they're worried about the depletion of water or whatever, or the protests in Poland, it's just a, a fascinating sort of device. And you're saying that that's similar to the Koran? Well, absolutely. It's, it was basically, it's this overarching power and knowledge. I think that's what was the sense for the little person in, in Kazakhstan, that, that which was the truth. And, and actually, of course, the um, <clears throat> Soviet Union was, deliberately um, opposing Quranic values. So it wasn't just a, it's not, this is not just an accident. Um, and actually for the, for, for Nazir, who's the older character, and then, then confronting these two issues and finding that actually Allah didn't seem to be able to, to combat the Soviet Union was a kind of great, a great crisis in faith. Hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the major themes that you see throughout is this interaction between sort of leaning to Soviet and, and atheistic versus a uh, secular world versus, uh, you know, a Kazakh traditional, uh, deeply Islamic world. Um, there's a lot of contradictions like that in the text. Uh, how did you approach those? How did you approach this, some of these contradictions? Well, I think the the... For me, then, it's the same as what I was talking about with the, the, the writing poetry, is that the ideal for me is to get into the mind and heart of the author. 
Now, the kind of thing, the interesting thing is <clears throat> that Roland, if you may meet him one day, and I hope, hope you do, he's mm. he is a, a very contradictory character. He's both very belligerent and uh, uh, and aggressive at the same time as being. He's come from a very macho culture. He used to be a, a boxer, a champion boxer in his 20s. But he's also incredibly thoughtful and very, very sage and kind of very... Um, uh, 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 and exudes a lot of wisdom. And I think that, uh, that there's that mixture of pugnaciousness and um, spirituality, which inflames the book throughout. And I hmm. think it's kind of that, that's what I had to, I, it, as writer, I had to be, you were, one of the things that you were, to, that you were talking about is that actually <clears throat> that the book is incredibly long, like a lot of um, Asian and Indian books. And there was a temptation of thinking, I've got to, I've got to be brief here. I've got to kind of, this, this doesn't, this is not going to work for, for, for Western or this, maybe I should edit it a bit. But one of the things that I had to learn to do is to think in the way that actually an Asian uh, Kazakh storyteller would have, which was very much more discursive, very much long, and to enjoy the longers of a very long, um, explanatory or, or narrative passage which doesn't necessarily move the plot forward but actually to relish that kind of complexity and static thought if you, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something that it it's it also has sort of a connection um i don't i'm not mm -hmm. i forget where i was thinking about this i'm sure someone else mentioned it as as i was looking over the book but um and and you see them surface in the book but uh mm -hmm. russian authors and sort of like uh you know dostoevsky and and there's these sort of like it's not necessarily moving the plot forward in their books but but these long descriptive paragraphs that that are sort of the joy of reading the book um so yes. that's yeah i think one of the things is that i mean i've 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 gradually learned more about russian culture and i think it's also so true of, uh, of central asian cultures is that small talk isn't kind of part of the culture Ru russians don't talk small very often um, if you've had to go and sit in there, they're, they're, it's actually quite often it, it's deep and long conversations uh, um, full of meaning. And I think that's it's something that when you read those books <coughs> like the Dostoevsky, it's not necessarily just an author writing like that of great length. That's actually how a lot of Russian people interact. They kind of do are deeply serious at times. They're also wild and kind of, um, um, flamboyant. But that kind of element of seriousness and reflection is is a is a is an inherent part of the culture. Hmm. And one of the things and the things that the book will make people reflect on and and think about it's deeply interwoven in this text and and apparent throughout is the conversation about the environment. Um, and you know you have that great cover image with the boat in the middle of a desert and, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the image but at the heart of this is sort of a, a natural disaster um, that you know maybe as great as Chernobyl that people simply don't talk about how much is this in an environmental history I think it's a well it's, a, it's an interesting thing because of course the environmental disaster is right at the heart of the novel and that is the the thing that gets the, the action moving. Um, but I think the way Roland's talking about it is that the, the, the damage to the environment is actually a, a crisis of spirituality and humanity rather than an environmental dancer. He's not an environmentalist in that sense. Um, but it's an interesting out, outlook on life because I think one of the things about why we have the, we, we, the environmental crisis, of course, has come to the fore in the West with Greta Thunberg doing her extraordinary speech at the UN last week. But what's interesting about um, the Western approach to environmental crisis is that this is a crisis about the climate. It's a crisis about the environment. It's a crisis about um, poverty in various different parts of the world. But what's interesting about the way Roland and the, the approaches this book is that 
it's not a crisis really about the wildlife. I mean, it's actually the damage to the fabric of humanity that's the key, key element of it. Um, and so in some ways that's quite instructive because it may be one of the reasons why um, we find it quite hard in the West to, to deal with the environmental crisis is not so much because of the opposing sides, but because of it's a, it's a, we have a flaw, a, a spiritual flaw, if you see what I mean. And maybe that is, it's, it's, that is something that we're, we're, we're doing as much damage to ourselves as we are to the environment. We are part of this world, not, not connect, disconnected. And I think that's what, um, Roland's book kind of looks at the, the as you see, Nazir talks about the, uh, the RLC almost as if it's part of his personality, as if it's part of his being. It's not something that's external that's, uh, that's being damaged. It's actually a damage to himself. And I think that's one of the things that's different in the West is that we see nature, climate as outside ourselves and therefore something that we act to protect as outsiders, but not actually we are self-farming basically. Yeah, and and that that theme, you know, obviously, like you said, it's the heart, but uh, the way it pops up throughout, it does really make you stop to reconsider. And like you mentioned, there was the speech last week, uh, you know, and everyone was so inspired, and then everyone just okay, well, I'm inspired. Now I'm going to go get my cup of coffee and throw the coffee cup out anyway. Um, yeah. But but you can see Roland is is struggling with it, like he said, at a different level. One thing he points out is this idea of private property. Like we own that land. Each republic owns its property, which is interesting for the RLC because it's between these different Soviet republics. Um so, so how do we sort of interact with this massive, the fourth largest sea in the world that's between certain um, areas? Now, now, I've heard this described as like a sort of Soviet ticking time bomb that they set up in drawing the boundaries at certain points where these republics would always battle over them. Did you get that sense when you were in Kazakhstan or did you see more like a collaborative shared history? Uh, well, that's an interesting thing, is that, is that actually n there is not so much collaboration between the Central Asian, in fact, uh, Central Asian countries. I mean, they've gone their, their different ways. Um, and they've, they've long had histories of tribal and interleasing warfare. Um, so, but there is a sense now, and I think it's, it's beginning to emerge, that they're actually... Um, their shared culture is more important than the dissimilar effects of them. And I think that's quite an interesting development because I think that's emerged from being equally oppressed in Soviet times. I mean, they have, they're still, they obviously politically they are very different because um, one, the, one, the author I was talking about earlier, Hamid Ismailov, can't live in Uzbekistan. He, 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 um, he's been forced to, to live in the UK because it has what is effectively a dictatorship. Um, and people who speak out of line, which what uh, Hamid is not a particularly political writer, but he is perceived as being a danger. And so there are those kind of differences between the countries. Um, and mm -hmm. It's the national, but nationalism is a very personal thing. The, the, the Kazakhs are very nas nationalistic. I can translate it another Kazakh um, poet who's a, a, a man called Galen Mutanov. And his big poet, poem, his big poem, is about the, the relationship between Kazakhs and horses um, and how the, the horse gives Kazakhs its meaning. But there is something about that which seems quite old-fashioned. Um, hmm. It seems like clutching at straws rather than, that, rather than something that's really important. I may be wrong about that, but that's my impression, is that actually the things have changed so much under the Soviet Union that there, that there is no real way of going back to that. 
Hmm. And that's one of the things that the characters grapple with throughout the book is this uh, reversal where <laughs> at, at one point, I forget who one of the characters describes, he says, well, Russians are the nomads now. Kazakhs are no longer nomads. It's the Russians who come and live in the nuclear facility and then go back to Russia. Um, and we are confronted with change as well in the fact of the sea. So you have people who might have been fishermen for generations and come from fishing families, and suddenly that's just not a possibility anymore. So, so what do you do? Are, are there um, programs helping transitions to new sort of things? Because the book kind of leaves us at this big moment of a, of a Soviet downfall, but but what's the future for Kazakhstan? Well, interestingly, I mean, I think that um, the youth of Kazakhstan are surprisingly energetic and out outward looking, um, and the younger younger people are surprising. And, and I think that they they they've realised um, that by being internationalist, actually they can move forward and build something which is extraordinarily Kazakh. Um, when I met this um, billionaire, he's one of one of these one of what one of these it, people who inherited wealth from from various aspects of the Soviet Union. But actually he kind of built he's a, a very enlightened youngish man who built up his main main wealth from mining gold in Iran. Um, but this, this was with, with a purpose, basically. It wasn't just to um, make himself money. And he's, what he's done is he's kind of gone back to his country and reinvested in what, a, what is a sustainable future. Because one of the things is that Kazakhstan is rich in mineral resources. And so is it, it's seen as base, it has been seen as basically a place, place which is exploited for its mineral wealth. And that's great. But actually, it doesn't feed back to people. But what this man is doing is he's invested hugely in sheep farming um, because basically to, to immediately to the east, they have China, which is a massive market for sheep. Um, and so he's equipped, he's reintroduced sheep farming and given farmers uh, and, and herders a new way of life. And basically the, the sheep are given... Um, so that they can be tracked over vast acres of uh, vast areas of the steppe. And it, he's, he's now got about 3 million sheep that, and they're all under computer control, basically. But it's not, it's not to minimize labor. It's actually to uh, allow people to find their, find wealth, a sustainable wealth within the, within the steppe, which, it, which was gradually losing its kind of identity. Hmm. It's fascinating to see that, uh, that this, you know, step identity kind of comes and goes and struggles through these changes. But one thing that's interesting about the fall of the Soviet Union is it kind of gave the Kazakh people at least a chance to sort of reconsider their place. Whereas we, uh, when I read about a lot of these environmental disasters, I think immediately of parallels in the United States, just like there was nuclear testing in the Kazakh step, you know, there was nuclear testing in, in Arizona and Nevada. Yeah. Uh, just like the sea was drained, the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan, the, you know, the Lake Tulare was drained in California to pump water to Los Angeles and to create a, a fruit market in Central California. Um, but in the United States, there was no sort of restructuring um, <laughs> because, yeah. because yeah. nothing has yeah. collapsed. So how important is that restructuring in forming the identity? I think it hasn't been as restructured as much as um, some people would like. And I think it's, it, it's not something that's happened overnight because, of course, um, a lot of the people who are in power in Kazakhstan now, uh, uh, even though they, are, they may be Kazakhs, they were the same, same people who were in power uh, in the Soviet Union. So the, the power structure is not so different. Um, and I think it's a, the, that it, it is not as a democratic a country as it might be. Um, so I think that, yes, it, it did provide a kind of 
the Philip, the kind of the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, kind of. But, but for a, a lot of people, um, things haven't changed that much. Um, mm. it's, it's it's people down the bottom of the pile. They haven't changed that much, um, and I think it's something that um, they're keen to change. And one of the interesting changes this year is that uh, the the, pre the the president of who Nurselt and Nobaya. Uh, um, who's, who's been president since it was independent? He, re, he retired this year and, get, um, and passed over the presidency. But what was interesting is that one of the first acts of the new president was to name the, the, the new capital, Astana, after Nazarbayev. Um, so the, the capital has changed its name to Nir Sultan. And a lot of the, the, there, is, there is a lot of controversy over that because some people think. This is such a backward step, uh, and some people think it's no problem at all. We should honour a, a president who brought help bring us independence. But hmm. there are those kind of ambiguities and conflicts. And so, one of the things, as the world, at least the Western world, tries to um, figure out some of these uh, Central Asian nations that are, you know, kind of widely misunderstood, uh, or at least not, there's not much effort, is obviously literature is going to help. Um, and and you've had experience in Central Asia. Can you kind of give us a, a sort of, of a view of the field? Are, are we going to start seeing more and more translated volumes coming out to in the West? Uh, uh, do you think it's going to appeal to wide masses? Are, are we going to have more people traveling over there as a result? I think, yes, I think <clears throat> there's a possibility. There isn't a vast amount of novelistic literature um, because, of course, Poetry is there is so important that there haven't been many novel writers, um, not not in the sense that there have been in the, in the West, but the few who do write novels are, are, are extraordinary, and I think a bit a few more of those are beginning to be translated. And in some ways, I think there is a possibility that Central Asia could be viewed as in the way that Central America was um, when in. Uh, 40 years ago, when a great host of Central American and Latin American authors suddenly came to prominence and raised the, the cultural perception of, of Latin American countries. And I think the same could happen here, but it, but, um, it requires a reader, readers to take that leap of faith into going along with a very, with very different a long, apparently long-winded narrative. Um, once you get into them, right. they're breathtaking. But they take some, they aren't page turners. There's no way they're page turners. And so, um, um, there are, there are a few books that are like that. But page turning is not one of the the priorities of of the of the Central Asian novel writer. Hmm. They're hey. much more thoughtful and, and reflective. Um, and it it's you, 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 yeah, I think just as the people gave their time to a, a poet when they recited a poem that lasted 12 hours, you just give your time and go with the flow, and then it suddenly becomes a very different and quite enlightening experience. Huh. Yeah, it's a very interesting, especially um, in this day and age when it seems like information's being condensed um, and processed. The goal is as fast as possible. I know as a historian, you know, um, it, it seems we're being pushed to write smaller and smaller things, although history is one of the last, you know, sort of holdouts where we do full, full books. Um, what about the interaction? So you have this sort of link, you know, you've kind of established it. How might others get in interact? Because Central Asia, let's face it, is not the most accessible place in the world. Um, perhaps for Europe, it's not too bad. Um, but it, but it's still far and it's vast. H how else could people sort of interact with Central Asia, say in the United States or in the UK? Well, there's, there are, there's, it's an I'm a part of a, 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 and I'm just about to take over as chairman of this, uh, an organization called the Eurasian Creative Guild. And the whole idea of that, it's still very small, but the whole idea of that is to do events in, uh, locally all around the world. 
And there are organizations already existing in, um, in, in the United States that, that are developing these. But was one of the things, for instance, is that there are um, dance, uh, uh, Central Asian dance companies. There's, uh, there's, there's one in Oregon, uh, which, is a, which does some beautiful work. And I think that actually, and there are films that you can watch, um, like there's one called Kelim. Um, so mm. it's possible to find these things. Um, but I think in some ways, the best way is through the literature. And I, I mm. uh, um, um, what, because one of the things is that it's, it's instant in terms of you put, you get a book and you can see it and it kind of gets, gets you into it. And I think one of the things is that once you've read a book like, like Roland's book or, mm. or, or Hamid's, Hamid's book, especially, um, what they do is they give you a desire to kind of go and see, well, where, where does that come from? Where does that hmm. um, And I think the other thing is that um, one of the things that in the States, you have a very powerful Native American culture, which um, looks back to kind of the, the, the more primeval days of humanity. And I think one of the things about Central Asia is it carries a lot of the, the the myths that we carry into our everyday life. Um, we look at them, we've seen them in movies, but actually one of the things that they, in some ways that they're still alive in um, Central Asia, like for instance, then you see it's they still exist. There are people that train eagles to hunt. They ride on horseback. Hmm. Um, and these are spectacular and that you, you, you can hardly believe that they still exist because they sound like something out of an old fashioned storybook. Hmm. Um, I mean, one of the things is that, for instance, they, the Kazakhs are quite clean, keen to claim is that the Arthurian legends are actually basically Kazakh in, in origin. Um, hmm. And their kind of idea is that the Sarmatian horsemen came to uh, the, the, the British Isles and established this tradition of chivalry and horsemanship. <laughs> <coughs> so I think that basically, um, there are, of course, I, 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 everybody has their own way of getting into culture, but I think one of reading the books is probably the most valuable, and, and actually enjoying the poetry as well, because yeah. I think that it's a, it's a step backward from our, uh, from, as, you, as you were just saying, it's a step from our high speed world. Um, that's actually something that can be very refreshing for all of us. Yeah. And one of the things you, again, you can just kind of alluded to what I was going to ask next, but um, is I think a lot of people in the West might not have the best relationship with poetry. Um, <laughs> Yeah. because of the way it was taught or, or whatever, you know, the, just yeah. the preconceived notions. I, <laughs> I had to memorize poems up until about fourth grade and then I never interacted with poetry again, pretty much. Um, and so it took a while to sort of gain that appreciation again. Um, what, what is your advice to people who are kind of uh, hesitant about dipping, dipping their toes into this vast ocean of poetry? Well, I think actually, I think, that the younger generation are changing that altogether because I think spoken word poetry and internet poetry and Insta poetry, which is poetry on Instagram, is changing that hmm. in a quite dramatic way in the West. And it's interesting, um, I had to do, a, that, do an article for Kazakhstan um, about what's happening in the West. And, it, well, and it, it's absolutely fascinating because I think partly it came out of rap poetry um, in, in the last at the end of course the end of the last century and now in this century all kinds of spoken word poetry but the in internet has become um it, it's uh, it's an interesting thing that in publishing poetry is now the fastest growing sector of all hmm. um, and it's so it's changing so i would say that people who have um might be afraid of a a, 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 a kazakh epic poet or something like that but actually, you can get into spoken words. Like you can get into Insta poetry on on the on Instagram, and it's very incredibly accessible. It really is. Because an Instagram in Instagram poet is, is is about the same length as a haiku. It's only about uh, it, I can't remember the exact word count, but it's very very short. Um, hmm. And so it's very accessible. And uh, and and I think that a lot of poets from that are beginning to kind of say, okay, 
yes, it was a great way of getting into it, but actually you want something a little bit more considered. And so actually from that, poets are beginning to use, look for longer forms. And I think that's the fact that, I, in, interestingly, actually, there's a, there's a, spoke, a, a leading spoken word artist um, called Pete the Temp in the UK, who's just done a book on the, the rise of spoken word poetry. And yeah. what's interesting is that he knew nothing about the spoken word poetry, poetry of Central Asia and how those rap battles existed, those great work. Um, and I was able to have talked to him about the revelation and how he's kind of absolutely fascinating that it's taught him a lot. So I think there is a kind of, there can be quite a, a powerful vocalization. I, and I don't think that people will find it quite so intimidating and dull as they might have done once. Right. That's, that's good. Uh, and hopefully, yeah, like you said, it's accessible and, and maybe this, uh, you know, opens those paths to literature that just take you all over the world that we've certainly found so rewarding. Um, now we're getting to towards the end of the podcast. This is the part where each of us give a suggestion for the listeners of the Hour of History podcast. Obviously, we suggest that you go and check out this fantastic book and the link, The Dead Wander in the Desert, and the links are all on hourofhistory.com. But if you had a, another suggestion to make, John, what would you give to the Hour of History listeners? Um. Well, I've got, I mean, I've got two interests, actually, at the moment. One is uh, this translating Central Asian poetry so, um, and books. And there is a, the author I mentioned earlier, um, Raphael Bukhariyev, I would read his book, Letters to Another Room. It's a fantastic, it's a very slow-burning memoir, but it's beautiful. And the other thing, actually, is the central concern of the, of the book, which is environmental damage. And I'm now, um, I don't know whether it's a coincidence, but actually I'm in part of the Extinction Rebellion movement. And I think actually reconnecting with the world and, and nature is, and our own kind of being is, right, is really important. And the, uh, those things all collide. Hmm. Yeah, those are two great suggestions. And as people are reading this book, I mean, I think they will <laughs> follow both of those suggestions and, and look into more uh, Central Asian literature. And definitely, I mean, the environmental stuff is just fascinating. As I was reading this book, I mean, I was researching throughout, well, did this happen elsewhere? What did they do? You know, so on. So that's great. My suggestion also comes from the book and is sort of related as well. It's the the music of Kazakhstan, the Dombra. Uh, yeah um and yeah. Th this is another cool thing that we kind of have today where you know i didn't have to go on a great search while reading this book i could just turn on my phone get spotify and there's this album of this string music that is just captivating from kazakhstan and certainly music like poetry you know music is poetry in a lot of ways um can transport you to these just great traditions that we might not have so much access to um, or even new exist. And it, it's just fantastic. So the music of Kazakhstan will really set the mood for this fine book. Ab absolutely. It's a, it is extraordinary. Actually, if you just reminded me, there's one mm -hmm. singer from Kazakhstan who I think he's already half a big star, but he's going to be a big star. He's, uh, he's um, now his name is safe for a moment, I've, which is annoying, but he will, you will, you will hear him and be amazed. He's a singer, a young singer with a with the, the most extraordinary range. And he's been wowing audiences wherever wherever he goes now in the world. He sells out. Um, That's awesome. Stadiums. Um, and I think that one singer uh, I, who will make more of a, an impact on the rest of the world than anything we've talked about here. <laughs> That's great. And I will certainly have links to those on hourofhistory.com. Um, before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I think that's, I think we've covered everything. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time. And it's got a great to talk to you. And I, I, and I hope people get to read Roland's book and enjoy it. Yeah, thank you so much. And the book is available now. It's just released and it is a fantastic read. So thanks for joining us, John, on Hour of History. It's our world anytime, any place. So long. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to check out our recommendations page at hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash R-E-C-S. There you'll find links to the books mentioned during the podcast. And if you choose to purchase one, you'll be supporting the podcast in the process. 
And if you still haven't gotten your fill of the Hour of History, make sure you head over to the Hour of History blog found at hourofhistory.com forward slash blog with articles being released fairly often on topics relating to those covered in the podcast as well as others. With that, we conclude this episode and hope to have you back for the next one. Take care. And again, thanks for listening to the Hour of History podcast. 